Describe for us what you mean by a kilo. What was the shape? It's kind of, it would be, I guess, kind of half the size of this right here and about double the width. That would be a tissue box. Yeah, maybe about half of this size here and probably about that wide. So it's a little more square than a tissue box? Yes. And that would be consistent with the size of a kilo of cocaine? Right. So these are like solid bricks? Correct. How much does a kilo cost? How much does it go for on the market? Roughly about $20,000. At what point did you sort of convert over from dealing in cars and houses to dealing in kilograms of cocaine? Do you remember what year that was? That was probably 2000, late 2002. How did you get into the cocaine business? Well, at the time the car business had, what I was doing had actually collapsed. So there was a lot of debt involved with repaying the individuals who had put the money up for those cars. So what the gentleman I was working for at the time suggested in order to pay these things back that I take up a new line of business. Who was that person? Terry Flannery. And how did you get to know Mr. Flannery? I got a chance to get introduced to him by another individual named Jerry Davis, who when I first met Mr. Flannery, I was getting cars for. Did you call him by the name Mr. Flannery or did you call him something else? I called him T is what we called him. Now you first got involved with T when you were buying cars for him. Is that right? Correct. What kind of cars were you buying for him? BMW and Mercedes, a lot of seven series Mercedes. I mean, seven series BMWs. Do you know anything about what Mr. Flannery's business was? Yes, correct. I did. And what was the organization that he worked with? It's called the BMF, Black Mafia Family. And what was his position there with the Black Mafia Family? He was one of the founders. Do you know who the other founder was? Demetrius Flannery. And did you call him Demetrius Flannery or did you call him something else? I called him Meech. Did you do business with Meech also? Yeah, but not directly through him though, you know, through his assistant. And who was Meech's assistant? His name was Jabo. Do you know what his real name was? Chad Brown. Now you start off with T or Terry Flannery, correct? How did you get introduced to Meech Flannery or Demetrius Flannery? Through Terry. Tell us about how you met him. Well, actually, one of the locations is called the White House, which at that time was probably across the street from where I have staying on Crystal Cove. This is right off of Evans Mill in Lithonia. I'm going to show you what's been marked as Government's Exhibit 1. Do you recognize that? Yes, this would be the location I just talked about, the White House. And this is what you refer to as the White House? Correct. Do you know why it was called the White House? Well, because the outside was basically all white. And this is where you first met Terry Flannery? Correct. What was the reason for you going over there? Well, at the time I was doing a lot of cars for one of his friends and he said that he needed, he had told the gentleman, Jerry Davis, I was doing the cars for that he needed a guy that could supply these vehicles as well. So it was for the purpose of actually getting started obtaining cars for Terry. And how long did you work in that? And that is getting cars for Terry Flannery. From 2002, you know, kind of up to early 2005. Now you said you actually started in the drug business in 2002. Were you doing both at the same time? Well, I should say, excuse me, 2001, probably because it was about 10 to 12 months before I actually started handling the drugs. So 2001 to 2005. All right. At what point did you learn that Terry Flannery, how Terry Flannery made his money? 
Well, he was different than most of the people I was helping to do vehicles. We kind of kept whatever their business was separate. But, you know, Terry was kind of up front. He just basically said that he met a whole lot of car guys before. And, you know, most of them claim to say they can do one thing. And then they deliver for a while and don't deliver. And he just said, you know, his things is drugs. He's in the drug business. He ain't going to sugarcoat it. And if I'm choosing to be in his business, then we're going to have everything out on the table and be open and honest about it. So he didn't cover anything up. So at what point did you become or did you become part of the BMF organization? Well, throughout a series of just probably maybe about 10 or 11 months down the line and more so when the closure of my car business stopped. Because at that particular point, Terry was like, well, you don't do cars for anybody else. Once you start handling and dealing in this cocaine business, you know, there's no more doing a car for an outside person or anything else like that. So that would probably have to be, you know, 2002 again through probably May. All right. So in essence, you started out with the car business with Mr. Terry Flannery and you mentioned several times now that your car business stopped. What happened to your car business? Well, there was a couple of things. One of the things was that there were one of the cars I had delivered. There was 12 kilos of cocaine found in one of the cars, the Porsche Cayenne vehicle. And another situation was was that there was identity theft being done and somebody had used exquisite empire to verify the jobs. So when the cars started getting taken off the road, they thought they were identity theft vehicles. And through further investigation, they found out that the cars did belong to individuals. But that's when the bank and wire fraud came in because the true act of the fraud was that the jobs were made up. The jobs didn't exist where we had the employment for the actual purchase of the vehicle. So at that particular point, probably about 200 cars had to come off the road with an average value of about 50,000. And was one of those cars Terry Flannery's car? Several. I take it he wasn't very happy about his cars coming off the road? No, ma'am. Is that how you got into the drug dealing? Correct. When you first got into the drug dealing business, describe for us how that process worked. Well, most of my clients were already drug dealers who were driving the vehicles. So it was just a matter of getting the supply from Terry and actually getting over to my customers who needed the demand. So I didn't have to look far, you know, to find clientele. So your customers were actually drug dealers themselves. You weren't selling in the streets, as they say. Correct. And how was it that you already had these customers who were drug dealers? Well, because those were the ones that could afford you know, or who wanted to actually purchase these vehicles outright. But because of the currency transaction reports and different forms that, you know, you can't walk into a place with over $10,000 in cash and actually purchase these vehicles. So they needed to have a way to be able to live the way they wanted to live and do it within a parameter that wouldn't have a light shined on top of them. So would it be fair to say it was a fairly easy transition? You already had the customers in place from the car business to go to the drug business? Yeah, I had known for a while. I knew where they lived at. I knew where everything was in place. How is it that you were able to get the supply from Terry Flannery? Well, because having done business for him for such a period of time, you know, it was a situation where he knew that if I told him something, it was honorable. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't anything that he gave me money and I ran off. He understood that even the collapse of the car business wasn't directly attributed to me. So at the same token, it was a chance for him to get his money. He could recap his money back and at the same time, allow me to just isolate, just doing, you know, the cars and houses for him and at the same time earn a living as well. So you didn't actually stop the business altogether. You just kept that confined to the BMF organization. Yeah, for different members who needed, you know, different apartments, houses, cars for their own personal use. 
We need to stop for a break somewhere along in here. Actually, probably now is just as good as any. All right, let's take a 15 minute break, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. O'Brien, one of the jurors indicated to Miss Hannah she was having trouble hearing you. Remember to speak right into the mic. All right, we're ready. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Marshall, I'm going to show you what's been marked Government's Exhibit 27. We looked at it a few minutes ago. If you would look at pages 9 and 10 in that exhibit, do those pages actually have your signature on them? 9 and 10 does. And that's the same plea agreement you looked at before for the Northern District of Georgia? February of 07. And that's the one you actually signed? Correct. Okay, now when we left, we were talking about someone you know as Terry Flannery. If you'd look at Government's Exhibit Number 22A, do you recognize that individual? This is Terry. Your Honor, we'd offered Government's Exhibit 22A into evidence. No objection. 22A is admitted. Is this the individual that you know as Terry Flannery? Yes, it is. Now, I'm also showing you Government's Exhibit Number 15A. Are you familiar with that? Yes. You testified you know an individual by the name of Demetrius Flannery, right? This is correct. Would you recognize him if you saw him? Yes. Your Honor, we would offer Government's Exhibit 15A in evidence. It's already in. Who is this individual? That's Demetrius Flannery. Now, this license says Ricardo Santos, but you know that individual to be Demetrius Flannery? Correct. How did you get involved with Demetrius Flannery? Well, just actually having a successful run of acquiring, you know, property and cars for Terry, he suggested my services over to his brother. All right. And so you were dealing drugs with Demetrius Flannery, or did you start with cars with Demetrius Flannery? started with cars and property. So at this point, Terry and Demetrius were still friends? Correct. Now, at some point, or at what point did you start dealing drugs with Demetrius Flannery? After the brothers fell out. So there was a parting of ways between the two brothers? This is correct. Now, at that point, you went to the Meech side, if you will, of the organization? Correct. Now, was it still BMF? Yes, the whole organization was still BMF. Describe for us the process when you would buy drugs from Demetrius Flannery's organization. Tell us a typical day in the life of a drug dealer. Well, it would start off with a phone call and actually saying that the vehicle is here. And then from there, we would, I would actually go over to a certain location that we spoke about. In this case, let's say it's one of the houses that we would call the gate and he would actually have everything, pretty much whatever your order was, if you ordered 15 or 20, whatever the case may have been, you would let him know that you have the money for it and they would already have it packed in a duffel bag or you would count them out as they were putting them in the duffel bag. And then from there, you'd get in your vehicle and go, you know, kind of like going through a drive through so how long would this process take you? 35 minutes. And was it the same every time? It was according to what money you had on hand. Now, what do you mean by that? It would be according to like, for example, if you have 400,000, then you could get 20 of them. If you had 300,000, you know, then at that particular point, okay, hold on. You said if you have 400,000, you can get 20 of them. 400,000 what? $400,000. And you'd get 20 of what? 20 kilos of cocaine. I'm sorry, you said if you get 400, you get 20. What if you showed up with less money? Well, it's like going shopping anywhere else. You're going to get less product. So would you place an order ahead of time? Yeah, you would have that conversation ahead of time. Like, actually, when you meet him, you say, look, I need 15 of them. He'd say, okay. Say today is the 12th. The van will be here on the 20th. 
So I'll call you and when I call you, just come over because it's already prearranged and pre-discussed of what you're going to get from him. Now, this is what you're describing happens at the gate? Uh-huh. This is Government's Exhibit 6A. Do you recognize this house? That's an aerial view shot of it. Of what? Of the house called the gate? And you've been to this house before? Several times. How big is this house? Do you know? Probably about 3,200 square feet. It's not a small house? No. All right, now you said whenever he would call you, you would place your order with this individual. Who are you talking about? This would be Jabo, Chad Brown. Now, what was Jabo's relationship to Meech? Because this is Meech's side of the organization, right? Right. So, what's Jabo's relationship to Meech? He's the underboss or the VP, vice president, you know, sort of his right hand man his assistant. Now, when you get there, how many people are there? Like, for instance, when you're going to pick up a delivery of cocaine at the gate, how many people are there? On the average of probably about eight to nine people. And what are these eight to nine people doing? It was various jobs, you know. You probably may have, you probably may have two or three people counting money. And then you probably would have Jabo there and you would have another two people or so helping fill the duffel bags up and actually get your order to you. And then the other individuals would be those who either lived at the house or who were just actually hanging out at the house. Who were some of the people that you saw on? How many times did you go over to the gate to make purchases? Probably about seven to ten times. Now, is the gate here in Atlanta? Yes, it is. When you went over to the gate this seven or ten times, who were some of the people that you would see there? Let's start this way. Who were the people that typically counted the money? You would have a gentleman by the name of Little Rob. You would have Blue Da Vinci. You would have Throwback, D-Shock, and Tito. And who were the people, as you said, placing the orders and filling the bags? That would normally be Tito or D-Shock, normally those two. And also on occasion, I had actually received the orders passed to me from Blue. And that was on one occasion. You said there were typically other people who either lived at the house or hanging out at the house? Right. Who would those people be? For example, one of the individuals would be Mr. Fleming's right there. You said Mr. Fleming's right there. Who do you mean? Huh? You said Mr. Fleming's right there. Who do you mean? Fleming's Daniel. Can you describe him for me? Yes, he has a tie on sitting next to his attorney. What does his hair look like? Bald black guy. Your Honor, let the record reflect he's identified the defendant. No objection. It shall. Now, when you saw Mr. Fleming Daniels there, what... Do you know him by another name? Ill. Is that what you called him? Uh-huh. When you saw Mr. Daniels there, what was he doing typically? Well, there was... Most of the occasions, he was just there on, you know, talking to the other bosses and instructing people on different things to do and playing pool, and we used to gamble a lot, you know, gambling on dice, gambling on shooting pool, and also there was an occasion there that he also was picking up drugs as well. Now, you said that he's there and he's talking to the other bosses and everything. Is that in the area where you're picking up these drugs and dropping off the money? Yeah, it was like it's all on one floor, all on one level of the living room, and the bedroom is all just like one floor, one large common area. From one area to the next, can you see what's going on? Well, if you're at the pool table, you could actually see where you're receiving the bag at unless it was a different, like unless it was a different day when they were actually doing it downstairs. But in most cases, if you're in one area, yes, you can see where the drugs is being packed.
Now, if it comes down to where the money is being counted at, that's going to be in the back room. That's Jabo's bedroom. You can't see from the gambling area to where the bedroom is. You said that on one occasion, you actually saw Mr. Fleming Daniels picking up drugs. Tell us about that incident. I was there picking up about 20 of them to go to Tennessee with it, and he was also there picking up as well. The exact amount, I don't know, but it was probably just from the size of the bag, it was a little bit more than mine's. Why is it that this particular incident sticks in your mind? Because, you know, it wasn't a regular time that I would see him over there doing that. Now the gate. Does anybody actually live at that residence? Yeah, you know, Chad Brown was living there. D-Shock was living there. I believe it had roughly about three or four, about four bedrooms to the house. I believe Blue stayed there was living there on and off, but there was always somebody home. Now, let's go back to the process of them bringing the drugs in. How would the drugs, were you ever there when the drugs actually arrived at the house? On one occasion, or maybe more than one occasion, about two occasions. How did they get to the house? Normally, there was a white limousine, and there was also a Lincoln Town car, and there was also a van. Those are the two ones that stand out in my mind. Are these cars that you had obtained for the BMF? No. Did you ever see where the drugs were in these vehicles? Yeah, there was trap compartments hidden behind the seats. Like if, okay, if you're going to enter a limousine and you're opening the back door, they would be on the long wall here. If you've ever been inside a limousine, across from that, there would be a little bar area that they have, but they have a long seat that goes all the way to the back. It would be behind that seat. That seat would automatically fold down. So you actually saw them take drugs out of this compartment before? Yes. Once the cars arrived, what was the process? Well, at that particular point, they would take... I spoke earlier to you about there's a room that's downstairs and they was taken out, counted and separated into, you know, orders that you would have if you have ordered something from Sam's Club or anywhere else, they would break down. If you have 120 of them, they would break them down to who's getting what, who's getting what. So when everyone is actually coming through, you know, this is sometimes could be during the day so that everyone gets their orders and it all be done in less than an hour. All right, what was the volume? What was the quantity of drugs that they were bringing in, like in the limos and town car from your experience? They would normally hold about 100 to 150. 150 what? Kilograms, I mean keys. How frequently would these loads come in from your experience? Probably once every 10 days. Now, when you were there picking up your drugs, you said Jabo was there. Was Meech ever there when you picked up your drugs? Not at that location, but at a different location that was at a house that was on Glen Ridge that we called the Elevator House. I showed you what's been marked as Government's Exhibit 7A and 7B. Do you recognize those? Yeah, that's the location. That's the house. Now, is this what you refer to as the elevator? Correct. Why is it referred to as the elevator? That was a name that I actually gave it because there was a glass elevator being installed inside the unit. And that's where you saw Meech whenever you went to pick up drugs? Right. When you're around Jabo and Meech whenever you're going to pick up your drugs, were they actually handing out the drugs? At that location there, I received it directly from Jabo. The elevator? Yes. Was that unusual for Jabo to hand you the drugs? No, because that was their personal house, so that was their usual thing. What about Meech? Did Meech ever actually hand you drugs? No. Did you ever see Meech touching the drugs, literally touching the drugs? No, 